How do you prepare for a PM job interview? Stay tuned. Becoming a project manager has never been easier. The Lewis Institute, helping to certify project leaders. Welcome once again to another episode of The Inquisitive Analyst. I'm your host, Marcus Yudekang. And today, my guest is an educator, a project manager and speaker. He's also an author of several books on project management. And he runs two YouTube channels, online PM courses and management courses. So please help me welcome to today's show, joining us all the way from the Winchester area, UK, Dr. Mike Clayton. Welcome, Mike. Hello, Marcus. It's, it's great to be with you. Thank you for being on the show. I'm intrigued by your uh, YouTube show, which I've watched um, many, many times. And I want to start by asking, how did you get started in project management? I, I suppose the obvious answer is I was a management consultant and started managing both client engagements and then managing projects for four clients. Uh, but the real truth is, I think it was at university when I was uh, entertainment's officer for the student union and ran events and had to make events happen. And, you know, event management is the entry drug to project management for many people. So I took that. And then when I was in consultancy, I knew that I wanted to do project management. And my first boss said, yeah, but you can't because you haven't been trained and uh, we can't train you. And fortunately, I changed jobs and got my project management training. But actually, that's what led me to creating online PM courses, because I realized there are probably a lot of people whose organizations can't or won't train them in project management. So I thought if I can make it affordable for people to get the training and subsequently on well, the YouTube, make it free for people to get some of the, some of the knowledge. Um, that's, that's my kind of thing is that I was denied training when I really wanted it. Um, but yeah, I think it goes back to university and organizing stuff. So you're in an interview, mm -hmm. an interviewer may want to hear about how you make decisions, any advice mm. on how PMs should make decisions. Yeah. I mean, a good decision so let's just define what a good decision is. A good decision is not defined by being right okay. because you can't know a decision is right at the point you make it. So we need to find other criteria and a good decision therefore has to be made with the best evidence reasonably available. And by reasonably available, I just don't, I want to avoid not making a decision until you've got every last scrap of data because that will never happen. Um, you need a decision needs to be made by the right person or the right people. And by right, we're talking about, frankly, authority. Mm -hmm. Authority in the sense of have you got the hierarchical authority? Are you at the right level of the organization? But also, do you have the intellectual authority? Do you have the chops? You know, it's no good saying, well, I'm under big boss, I can make a decision if you don't understand what we're talking about. So, you know, if we're making a big complex IT decision, yes, the CEO has the the hierarchical authority. They possibly haven't got a foggiest idea whether this system or this system get so the IT director needs to be in on that decision. Um, and the third thing you need is a sound approach to methodology, system, whatever, that doesn't just go, mm, wind's blowing into the left, so we'll we'll pick that choice. You've got to have a, a sound process of discussing it. So what do project managers need to do? They need to listen to a range of points of view from the kind of people who have relevant things to say they have the right experience the right expertise they need to get good data good evidence they need to look at that and they need to examine it and start with the evidence and see where it leads rather than start with the conclusion and look for evidence to justify it which leads us to confirmation bias and we all know how serious a problem confirmation bias can be um in society as well as in projects um and and then yes do by all means use your intuition uh if you if you if you have the depth of knowledge and understanding that makes your intuition valuable but whether or not you use your intuition you've got to apply a logical approach to an, analyzing that data either to test your intuition or because you don't have an intuition and so you've got to find it so um, be systematic you know talk to people listen to them get the evidence assess it um, 
and do that as quickly as you can but it's just like everything else in project management it's a balance of of time and quality in this case you know if you rush a decision you don't get the quality but if you can if you can't afford to wait then you must take mm. more risk we're in the interview we're being asked questions as a project manager mm -hmm. how best can this candidate answer questions precisely during an interview what's your recommendation step one listen to the whole question what happens is you start asking a question and my brain starts processing what's he talking about and immediately i start kind of i know i've got to answer a question so i'm thinking how am i going to answer that question so i'm, const I'm constructing the beginning of my answer while you're finishing the question which means i may well miss the question you actually asked because i'm presuming i know what you're going to ask and I think that comes from school. I don't know what the Canadian system's like, but here in the UK, you seem to get points from your teacher if your hand goes up straight away. Yeah, I know the answer, miss. <laughs> the problem is, if an interviewer asks me a question or a project sponsor asks me a question or a stakeholder asks me a question and I have an answer instantly, got it. What does that actually say to that person? What it says is, I know that answer straight away. How could I know that answer straight away? Well, it can only be because it was an easy question. Who asks easy questions? Stupid people. If you answer the question without any pause, you're basically saying, thank you, stupid. I know that one. Listen to the whole question and then think. Don't be frightened of that pause. And answer the question that is asked rather than what you expect the question was going to be when they started it. Um, secondly, have a clear structure. That is when you're preparing for your interview, think of, I call them structure response formats, simple little structures. Like, um, one of them I use, I call CSI, um, which is context, uh, solution insight. So, ah, here's the context uh, of my answer. Here's the, you know, here's, a, here's an example that I gave. The solution I found was, and in, what I learned from it is, when you've got that framework, that enables you, A, to answer very clearly and make sure you get a good answer with all the components. But secondly, you know when you've got to the end, which means you can do the one thing that bad interview candidates don't do, which is once you've answered the question, stop. Excellent. Splendid. Fantastic. <laughs> and don't be afraid of that silence. The person in the room who has the greatest confidence with silence tends to have an upper hand uh, and, and the confidence to say, I've answered the question. And if you're just going to look at me, I'm going to wait till you ask me the next question. That's, you know, control. If, if, if I didn't answer the question and you don't think I answered the questions, don't stare at me. Ask me a follow up because uh, I'm done. I've, I've given you my answer. If you lose your nerve, it's kind of like, who are you trying to persuade? Are you trying to persuade the interviewer or are you trying to persuade yourself? It's all the pregnant pause is very important. Yeah. You're in an interview. You're asked about how do you manage upwards? That is to senior leaders, C-suite executives, any recommendations on a good approach to answering that question? How do you manage upwards? Well, I mean... <laughs> We do need to do that a lot because, I mean, frankly, what project management ha manager hasn't had to manage their sponsor or their client sometimes, um, and that's sometimes quite a long way up. So the first thing to do is to understand what's important to them and how do they work. And how do they work is the easier one. What's important to them? You know, what they value. Are they doing this project or uh, are they... Uh, focused on building their own career are they focused on doing something for the business for the organization are they focused on protecting their team you know what actually makes them tick what do they want and also what do they want from you mm -hmm. so for example you're working for a sponsor how do, how do they like uh, how do they how do they think they want a sponsor project manager relationship to work uh maybe they've got experience and they know how they want it to work perhaps they haven't and this is their first time uh do they want you to run when they call or do you they want you to 
call home <laughs> first and, and on a cycle do they want lots of information do they want a little bit of information do they want to know only about the problems or do they want to know about everything uh you know do they do they want to sign off on this level of decision or do they want to influence that level of decision so find out how they like to work find out what matters to them um and then keep ahead of that i think the most valuable thing for this is um david maester uh, Robert Galford, someone green, can't remember. Galford, Maester Galford and Green wrote a book called The Trusted Advisor. And that applies really well to project managers. And they have the trust equation. And one of the elements of the trust equation is reliability. Mm. And you need to be reliable if you're managing upwards. But what the point they make, which I think is really important, is reliable doesn't just mean you do what you say you will do. Because if you ask me to do something by the end of next week, at the end of this week, I might be halfway to completion and bang on schedule. But you might be thinking, I haven't heard from Mike for a few days. What's he up to? I mm, wonder if he remembered me. I bet, he's, I bet he's doing something else. I bet he's doing something for someone else. I bet he's going to be late. God, that Mike Clayne is bloody rubbish. Sorry, I shouldn't swear on YouTube. Um, Still, there are worse channels than that. Um, so keep people informed. Let them know that you're being reliable. Don't just let them assume that you're being reliable because they won't. Because some people will think, oh, he said he'd get back to me in two weeks. So in two weeks, I'll, I'll be ready. Uh, but other people said he said he'd think he said he'll get back to me in two weeks. But I need to feel confident after a couple of days that he's still working on it. So, so be reliable. And the other thing, the other tip I've got, we all love to be flattered. I'm sorry. It's just the reality of human beings. And the higher we get up the tree, the more we expect it. Now, I don't mean, you know, tell your boss, you know, that's a fantastic tie you're wearing. I love that tie. Or uh, well, have, you, have, you, have, you, have you lost weight? <laughs> uh, what actually I mean by that is you know, the best way to flatter a boss, frankly, is to ask them for advice. Yeah. Not trivial, stupid things that make you look like you don't know what you're doing. But when, you, when you've got something a bit challenging, before you make a decision about how to do it, why not take the advantage to just tickle your, your boss's ego a little bit by saying, got a bit of a tricky one here. Uh, before I decide how to do it, what thoughts have you got? I have yet to meet a senior person who is not keen to give me their thoughts on how I should do something. But if they say, oh, I'm happy to leave it to you, that's great because you just got you know a blank check i mean nobody gives you a real blank check but it's pretty good so that that would be uh, that would be my last tip on that one i think well amazing i've often been told that you can show a portfolio to an interviewer mm -hmm. do you recommend a project manager bring a portfolio and if so what should be in the portfolio well interestingly i i've not really come across that kind of portfolio thing in project management in the UK, but that doesn't mean it doesn't happen here. But if I, if, if I were working with someone who said, I've been asked to bring a portfolio, first of all, what, what should be in that portfolio? Well, your portfolio is your portfolio in a way. You've, your experiences are your experiences. So you can't kind of say, well, you know, should have had some experience working in the agriculture sector for this job, but I haven't got any. So I'll put some in my portfolio anyway. <laughs> That's nonsense. But it's how you articulate that experience. So the first thing to do is just like just as with a resume, CV, whatever you call it, you don't have a standard resume and say, right, this is my resume. I'm sending it to every job opportunity. Nonsense. What you do is you take a look at the job opportunity. You find out what's important for that organization, for that particular individual, for this particular post, and then you strip out anything that's not relevant, you play down anything with low relevance and you build up the stuff that's highly relevant. And it's the same with your portfolio. You pick and choose from your experience and you pick and choose how you present it. And we all know that you can present things in a number of different ways and still be honest. And you need to be honest because if you get caught in a lie once, you will spend the rest of your career regretting that. Uh, you know, the, you know, even that, you know, that film Catch Me If You Can, they did catch him. You know, uh, he flew around the world as an airline pilot. He did medical things he, he taught in school all with no qualifications but he got caught uh so um don't don't lay to that so um 
but the other thing is just think more strategically than I forget what you put in your portfolio. We should always be thinking, where do I want my career to go? What direction do I want it to go? And what should I be working on next to build the portfolio that I will need to get the career I want? And that doesn't mean that you have to know at the age of 20 what you want to be doing at the age of 50, because frankly, there aren't very many people who had the foggiest idea and, and, and actually achieved it. But it does mean thinking, you know, I don't think I'm ready for this kind of role, but that's the role I like, you know, after that, in which case this next role be thinking, how do I, how do I get onto my portfolio for next time? What I need. Um, so think about that, but then also present it really clearly. And I think your portfolio needs to tell a story. It needs to give a number of real situations that will resonate with the interviewing panel that say, oh, they can say, oh, that situation is not dissimilar to something that we might have here. And then you say, well, what did I have? What did you have to do? And what, as, a, as a project manager, as a project professional, as a team member, what did I have to do uh, uh, on, on that? Uh, and what we need to achieve? And therefore, what did I do? What actions did I take? What did I what did I get as a result? What did I learn? And sometimes, you know, you can be honest. So I didn't get the result I was expecting, <laughs> but boy, did I learn something. You know, you can you can present that. I mean, I don't think I don't think you want a whole portfolio full of failures, but I think you can show that you had failures along the way to your successes, because that's the nature of project management. Anyone who's interviewing a project manager and is not expecting that person to run into problems is probably not someone you want to work for. <laughs> um, you know, an organization that's expecting you to manage all their projects without any hiccups. You, you don't want that job. <laughs> you really don't leave it to someone else. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, build a portfolio based on what you've done, but then present it to show how it fits the context of the job. Make sure it's clear. Make sure it's a story. Your yeah. stories resonate. I think that's... Yeah. And also make sure, make sure you know what's in that portfolio. You know, if you prepared it and then six, seven, eight weeks later, you get called for interview, for goodness sake, read the thing the night before so that they don't say, well, in your portfolio, you mentioned, and you, did I? I wonder what that was about. You, yeah. I mean, we, when you and I were chatting and you said, oh, you know, uh, you put... You, you put something in one of your videos. It, chances are it was a video I made a few years ago. Now, I didn't know that you particularly watched that one, but I can't remember. If you were going to interview me about that and I knew, I'd watch that video. So, um, yeah. <laughs> Prepare. Uh, awesome. awesome. Don't be late. That's that's yeah. my good tip. <laughs> uh, don't be late. Don't miss the interview. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, no doubt. Uh, it's been a delight speaking with you, Mike. You have uh, you have a plethora of, of platforms out there uh, in cyberspace. How can someone can get in contact with you if they want to? Okay, so if you're a project manager and you're watching this and you and you want uh, free content, then my uh, YouTube channel is Online PM Courses. If you are of any kind of manager, project manager, any other manager, and you want some management training, uh, manage my YouTube channel Management Courses has whole courses on topics like organizations, uh, communication skills, negotiation, a lot that are relevant to project managers, um, and they're free on YouTube. So uh, that's management courses. If you want my structured content, uh, whether it's free or paid resources, written resources uh, for project managers, it's onlinepmcourses.com. And of course, if you've been watching this and you want to link with me on LinkedIn, um, I am the Mike Clayton on LinkedIn. Uh, you'll recognize me in the photo. Uh, but I always ask, you know, please say where you where you came across me so that I know uh, that, uh, how, you know, what your what our common interest is. So I'm always open to that. Great. Well, thank you once again for coming on the show, Mike. It's been an absolute pleasure. No, it's been a great fun for me, too. Thank you very much for inviting yeah. me, Marcus. Yeah, thank you. And and with that said and all, uh, um, have yourself an absolutely wonderful day. Thank you. You too. All right. Take care.